In South Korea from the mid-1990s to the mid-2000s, there has been an informal but clearly recognized divide between large record companies and small independent labels. These independent labels are commonly referred to as indie. I like your black. I like your, I like your. We call your black. But I personally think that the indie scene is what really shines about South Korea's music industry. So I think today we'll explore a little bit about how that industry came to exist. And I also want to talk about some interesting artists who've kind of become quite popular over the past couple of years. I also want to share with you some insight into recent events that almost killed the entire indie scene in South Korea. So make sure that you stick around to the end of the video for that. Also make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to this channel if you like the videos. Doing so helps this channel grow and I just wanna say thank you to everybody for all the amazing support so far. So let's get right into it. By the mid 1990s, South Korea's music scene was dominated by an increasingly distinctive brand of pop music. By enabling a strong mainstream set of artists to thrive, the Hallyu and new socioeconomic conditions can be said to be responsible for the growth of local indie pop music, which took off in popularity during the 2000s. The music stands in stark contrast to ordinary popular music. Inspired by similar movements in the West, Korean indie music is now featured in music festivals in Japan, all over Asia, and also in North America. So this is a fairly substantial scene in this country. Have you ever found yourself wondering, what does indie mean? Well, it turns out that South Korea seems to have the same problem. Indie is a very competitive term and can have various different meanings. The definition of the term seems to vary depending on who's using it. But in our case, it refers to the DIY ethos in terms of genres like rock and punk, an image that contrasts sharply with the artists of big commercial record companies. Indie musicians in the South Korean market tend to distinguish themselves in terms of genre. After Korea's music industry slowly rebuilt itself after the Asian financial crisis, some musicians had caught wind of some of the hugely prolific indie acts in the West and the new musical styles that had arose from those movements. This would include artists like the Jesus and Mary Chain, the Maccabees, Pavement, Echo and the Bunnymen, Pixies, Neutral Milk Hotel, The Cribs, and Sonic Youth. These guys had already established a meaningful counterculture in the West, but the size of the market and the attitude of the listeners in South Korea made for some fairly difficult beginnings for South Korean independent artists. The economic recession, the rise of digital music, and the rise in piracy have meant fewer CD sales even for conventional artists. The Hongdae scene also weakened in the mid-2000s, which contributed to the demise of the first wave of the indie scene, in combination with something that happened in 2005, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. In the late 2000s, along with the Korean wave, came the second wave of Korean indie. And perhaps no other band brought this indie attitude to the forefront of people's attention like the band Kiha and the Faces. Kiha and the Faces managed to connect with the new audience thanks to their 2008 popular single, Cheap Coffee. Audiences were drawn to his lo-fi simplicity and alt folky sound. Playful lyrics, his flippant vibe, and laid-back attitude caused his word to spread rapidly by word of mouth. He's not really known for putting a whole lot of emotion into his sound, but people were really into the sort of whimsical take on 1970s folk rock. The vocals were this really unpretentious, syncopated, part singing, part talking style. And I think the kind of laid back attitude really contrasted nicely with a lot of the mainstream music at the time. The name of the band, Jane Kiha and the Faces, comes from the nickname that they somehow picked up as the best looking of the indie scene. He's joined by bassist Jung Jun Yub, guitarist Lee Min Ki, drummer Kim Hyun Ho, and backup dancers the Mimi Sisters. One of the things that people liked most about him was that there was no huge marketing push. Um, all of his promotion was very homemade and community driven and he didn't need like a big campaign or sexed up advertisements or cameos with big artists, big K-pop artists. It was all very organically just passed around by word of mouth. Their first album, which translates to Living Without Incident or Living Plainly, sold out its initial run of 8,000 copies and they managed to get another pressing of 10,000 pressed right afterwards. Oh. 
He's won awards for the Netizens Male Artist of the Year, and his concerts sold out minutes after opening sales online. Another track on his record, which loosely translates into Was That Really Not There, is another charming track that was buried in his album. Perhaps the runner-up for second most important modern indie artist is Broccoli U2, a nitty pop band that gained popularity with their unconventional debut album, No More Encore, released in 2008. In terms of overall sales, they ranked at number 9 amongst other rock groups and number 1 amongst other indie rock groups. They also had success with their albums at the end of 2009. Broccoli U2 consists of four members who met at the Seoul National University around 2005. Duckwon is the vocalist, Jandy on keyboards, Hyangi on guitar, and Ryuji on drums. From the outset, they wanted the whole concept of the band to be something that was intentionally unfashionable and uncool. So among the various ideas that they had, they just came up with this sentence. It was broccoli soup with big pieces. You two are tasteless. And then they decided to shorten it. This concept was shortened into their name and became Broccoli U2. The 2007 debut EP, No More Encore, made waves with the Hongdae scene and their future releases would win them rewards such as the Korean Pop Music Award, Best Modern Rock Song for Universal Song in 2010, and the Korean Pop Music Best Modern Rock Song for Graduation in 2011. They managed to score some huge prolific performances such as the SNU Rock Festival, among others. Something that's really interesting about this band is the fact that the lyrics are a more calculated and logical critique of several social issues. However, fans do find a strong emotional connection with their music. Duquan is on record saying, Emotional? It's the opposite. My lyrics are very logical and to the point. If you write something really emotional at night and read it in the morning, you would feel really embarrassed, so I don't write lyrics emotionally. He then goes on to say, Maybe people who listen to our music are just emotional. Before we go any further, I think it's important to mention the three main districts that house the K-Indy scene. Shincheon. Until commercialization in the 1990s, underground music and student culture thrived in Shincheon, a university district in Seoul, during the 1970s and 1980s. Situated in northwestern Seoul, Hongdae is home to a vibrant and diverse indie music culture and to Hongik University, an institution with a prestigious art program. Having developed as the center of subculture since the 1990s, Chi Print enabled the establishment of numerous underground clubs, live music venues, record stores, and studios. This became a gathering place for talented indie musicians. Groups such as Crying Nut and No Brain are both indie bands that gained fame from a small club in Hongdae called Spot. One of the most famous clubs in Hongdae is Drug, which opened in 1994 and established their record label in 1996, having played a crucial part in underground music. Although Hongdae experienced a period of mass gentrification during the mid-2000s, it remains a significant indie music scene with over 40 underground clubs, attracting more than 500 new indie bands each year. Guanak is the working class area of southern Seoul, and it played a crucial role in the development of Korean indie music. It produced talented artists such as Kim Namhun and Change Kiha, both members of Nunko Band. Famous for being the home of the Seoul National University, student activism, political protests, and music were key elements in its culture until the 1990s. In the early 2000s, activities such as the campus song movement made Gwanak a center for experimentation in musical style, including the fusion of folk and rock, a crucial milestone in the Korean music industry. The indie label Bunga Bunga Records was established in 2004 as a result of Gronach's music culture. By the time the second wave hit, indie music in South Korea had become more diverse than in the past. As a kind of side effect of globalization, young rock groups began to incorporate English lyrics into their music this time as a stylistic choice, rather than instances in the past where musicians would copy the style of Western artists. In 1997, musicians, music lovers, journalists, academics, record collectors, and rock club owners formed their own online newspapers, magazines, and discussion groups, where they publicly discussed Korean and international rock music. After sort of falling out of the public eye for quite a few years, um, a lot of people who were kind of in the previous rock scene in South Korea also took advantage of the new indie push. Some even tried to revive their career with the help of a comeback. To help with this process, long-lost classic records of many great artists were re-recorded into CD format, 
reviving information about Korean rock tradition and presenting it to new audiences. Around this time, there's a series of short-lived rock clubs in the area that were referred to as the Hongdae app. Contrary to the assumptions of rock music fans, the uprising was not fully tolerated by the mainstream during the 1990s. Just as it seemed that Korean rock was about to gain wide acceptance among the broader community, it was unable to maintain its momentum as soon as the Hallyu began to take over. As a result, the Korean music scene began to revolve around youth dance pop groups, such as Seo Taji and The Boys. This popular group became the model of choice for upcoming teen idol groups, including the five-member boy band HOT and Finn KL. When K-pop spread to Asia in the late 1990s, at this point, most record labels had started to hyper-focus on exporting K-pop to the rest of Asia. As a sort of counter-response to this, indie groups like Kiha and The Faces had room to breathe, with customers tired of increasingly formulaic pop music. Alongside them, bands like Broccoli U2 and a band called Nine and Numbers began picking up a lot of traction as their songs resonated with a generation that was feeling voiceless. These new songs were self-made, thoughtful, intellectual, and critical of consumerism and pop culture. In 2003, Connell and Gibson point out that while the national output of large cities can be very significant, urban centers like Seoul are not considered a voice in international media. In fact, it's difficult to identify the sound of mainstream Korean popular music in any way related to a particular place, be it Seoul or any other city. In fact, most of the songs played in Korean national radio and television are similar to other Western pop and rock music, but at the same time, just sung in Korean language. Some scholars of popular folk and indie music have been drawn to alternative genres in search of a connection between local sounds and geography. For example, Eric Ma in 2002 explores the link between musical subculture and Hong Kong's Mong Ka for rap metal. Furthermore, Yoshi Takamori in 2009 examines the sound and scene of Shibuya K, a sound that emerged in metropolitan Tokyo in the early 1990s. Epstein and Dunbar in 2007 point out that finally through some indie releases in South Korea, we begin to see a geological link between sound, location, and style. For example, the early Hongdae scene was associated with sort of a punk sound. Such districts are the fashionable areas of the cities associated with them, and represent the argument of the strong characteristics of the city. The sounds associated with these places take on their own personality or characteristic, such as the Liverpool sound or the Seattle sound, where a local scene reacts to external development of new sounds. The reasons we've talked about so far, as well as the advent of online music sharing, have resulted in South Korea's indie scene absolutely exploding in popularity in recent years. There are so many super cool K-indie artists who I want to talk about on this channel, but I think it would be good to talk about a few who are really making big waves right now. Um, these are guys who are quite recognizable and quite popular at this moment. So here's a couple of them. Don has been in the music industry for a long time. He not only creates beautiful music, but he also writes for famous K-pop artists like Eric. He has albums freely available on YouTube and SoundCloud, which is where most of them originally debuted. Don has now been signed by Zeko's agency, KOZ Entertainment. Off On Off is an indie duo under YG Entertainment's sub-label High Ground, but they also began on SoundCloud. The group contains Zero Channels and Cold, both known in the K-Hip-Hop and K-R&B communities. Standing Egg Under Vaughn Entertainment, Standing Egg is an indie pop band with a dreamy, magical sound. He is known for his smooth ideas in music videos, as well as top-notch production. Standing Egg's debut album was released to Twitter and found success without any conventional press or publicity. Their song La 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 became popular after a fan-made music video went viral and the song was featured on various music charts. Since then, the band has been known for their ability to create chart-topping indie hits that haven't gotten the slightest bit of promotion from any mainstream record label. Soul Child's music speaks of lost love and joy. They have a talent of building an emotional connection to their audience. This artist explores a variety of genres, from R&B to jazz, from hip-hop to folk. His voice has the quality of providing comfort with just a few words. Other indie artists like Ocean and Rehab were quick to reach out and collaborate on several very cool releases. Morning is another lesser known artist who started his career with SoundCloud. Although he's still pretty underground, his music is a treat for the ears and owes much of his popularity to being continuously shared and re-uploaded on YouTube. 
Rehab started out on SoundCloud before signing with the Outwave label. He quickly achieved extraordinary success on the platform, and it shows through his work that he has been writing melodies since childhood. His music is now available on all music platforms such as Spotify and iTunes, and is highly recommended for anyone looking for something very warm and uplifting musically. Rehab just released a new EP, Love in Pearl. Make sure you go check it out here on YouTube. Lam C, singer, songwriter, and producer, is another well-known artist on this list who has signed with Happy Robot Records. Embracing the DIY ethos of production and songwriting, Lam C's work revolves around genres like jazz, funk, and ballads. Woods. Woods has an artistic style that is neither here nor there, and it's difficult to fit his music into a particular label. Although it's kind of debatable whether his music is indie or not, he certainly is an artist who deserves more attention. Woods had a long past as an idol before turning to solo music, and his experience gives him a confident and straightforward presence in his work. The Black Skirts One of the pioneers of the indie music scene, The Black Skirts, or Joe Hugh, is an indie rock musician who released his debut album, 201, produced by Kia Eshki, and immediately gained recognition and notoriety. South Korea's indie music scene seemed like it was just on the verge of exploding into the mainstream at the beginning of the 2000s. But in 2005, one particular incident ruined it, or almost ruined it, for everybody. After this happened, it would be years until the South Korean indie scene would recover and sort of reach the same level of mainstream popularity. In fact, I would argue that it never really recovered until the advent of the whole like YouTube SoundCloud thing. Music shows were always on the lookout for indie bands to perform, and NBC even established a show called Live Music Camp in 1999 that had a special segment introducing indie bands from around South Korea. During Rux's performance on July 30th of 2005, the band invited other bands up to the stage to try to liven up their performance. Things went off without a hitch for most of the performance until the end, when two men from the band The Couch and from Spiky Brats took off their pants and started jumping around the stage while fully, completely naked. Five seconds of nudity was recorded and broadcasted to the people of South Korea. These two men were arrested and charged with public indecency and interference with a the business. They also had to undergo drug testing and were eventually sentenced to two years of probation. Won Jong-hee, the member who invited the bands, was also arrested for inviting the two to perform at the show, despite stating in interviews that he had no idea that that was going to happen. This was the one incident that effectively killed the indie scene in South Korea. Live Music Camp was cancelled a more mainstream accessible show called Show Music Core was instated, and NBC suffered damage to their branding. It wasn't until the debut of Kiha and the Faces that the public slowly began to warm up to the idea of indie bands again, but the public perception had deteriorated to such an extent that it was still difficult to completely accept bands, and thus ended the golden age of indie in South Korea. K-pop has become one of South Korea's biggest exports through globalization and regionalization of its own right, but Korean citizens increasingly feel disconnected from its mainstream appeal. Despite K-pop's popularity at the time as the international face of Korean popular music, it is Korean indie music that has had this role in building a sense of place over the past couple of years. Anyways, that's all that I have for you guys today. Stay tuned for next time where we're going to talk about one of the coolest record labels in the entire country. These guys have been massively influential in the indie scene and there's a lot of cool artists that they enabled to have some very interesting careers. Stay tuned for more videos. I have a lot of stuff coming up on the channel. I have a Shibuya K follow-up video. I'm doing Future Funk. I have a jazz fusion video. I kind of just scrapped everything that I had with that and restarted because I decided that the visual style needed to be better. If you like, comment, and subscribe to this video, it helps my channel grow. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have an amazing week and I'll see you guys next time.